work through the day, right? Just some of them. Nice. Homework due today, quiz by Monday. It is Monday, Monday at midnight or mm -hmm. All right, let's get started. There's a small, small chance you might get out of here early today, okay? One, I didn't put up the notes for next time, but we're kind of right on track, so let's cruise, huh? This is a review anyway, right? Uh, housekeeping items, we have homework that's due today, right? Uploaded a grade scope. Then there's a quiz, it's available. It became available this morning, uh, but you have until the end of day on Monday to complete it, okay? And it's all about Moore's Circle, okay? Any questions there? Nothing? Okay. Uh, so to continue with our review, right? We talked about e we're talking about equilibrium of beams. The idea that we now need to come up with some solutions, right? Some internal stresses really is where we're headed for, right? Because as we looked at combined loading, we have combined we looked at combined stresses for axial and torsional systems. Well, in the real world, we have a lot of beams, right? These long, slender members that get loaded transverse to their longitudinal axis. Okay. And so these beams have different boundary conditions. We talked about, you know, or support conditions. We talked about those. Indeterminate versus determinate, same concept as you guys uh, saw in statics. Well, again, as we looked at with axial and torsional systems, right, if we have more unknowns than equations of equilibrium, which we have three of, then we have an indeterminate system, okay? We have different types of loading for beams. We have concentrated loads, uniformly distributed, linearly changing uh, distributed loads. Uh, and then potentially concentrated moments. At least those are the loads we're going to be focusing on in the class. We have these, the, well, we have our sign convention, right? We have our sign convention. Which I told you not to think back to more circle, right? And some of our internal shear stress sign, signs, right? For internal shear force, positive shear is whatever twists our beam clockwise. I always remember, for some reason, just ingrained is up on the left, down on the right, okay? So on the left hand side, of the left hand face, your shear is acting upwards. On the right hand side, it's acting downwards. Obviously, negative is the inverse of that. And then for positive moment, whatever puts our beam into a smile, right? Positive, negative, opposite direction, right? Or, which we'll get into calculating stresses, a positive moment creates compression in the top and tension in the bottom, and a negative moment creates the opposite, okay? So we're essentially going to be working through coming up with these internal forces, which those come from our external loads, right? And from those external loads, we can draw a free body diagram, figuring out what the internal forces are. Those internal forces and external reactions are helpful in determining kind of the overall behavior of the system and ultimately figuring out what our bending stresses are, okay? We have, we'll have shear stresses and normal stresses associated with bending, okay? So I assume you guys have come up with a solution to this potentially in statics, right? Simply supported beam with a point load at mid span, okay? Well, when we come up with our stresses, right? Just like we did in Moore's circle where we were figuring out what the stress is at any given plane. Well, in a beam, we need to figure out what our stresses are at any point in our cross section and that stress within our cross section, right, looking at, say, the top of the flange or the bottom of the flange in this beam, if it was being bent, okay, about a strong axis, right? We're gonna have different stresses throughout the cross section, but then the stresses in this cross section are a function of the applied loads, right? Which change our internal forces, and it's those internal forces that affect our internal stresses. And so we really need to know what is the internal force everywhere along these beam, this beam, and to do that, we create diagrams, right? Our shear and moment diagrams. 
So we determine at all points along the beam and we plot them to get our shear and moment diagrams, right? So if we looked at an example here, this is about as simple as it gets. Okay. We had a simply supported beam and it had a point load at mid-span. Okay. And we were to calculate, right, our external forces and our internal forces, internal forces being the, the shear and moment diagram. We'd start with a free body diagram, right? If we started this with a free body diagram, we would start by assuming we didn't know it's P over two, but we would say that this would be the reaction at A in the Y direction, right? This would be the reaction at C, point C in the Y direction, okay? And because we have a roller as depicted there, right? Because we have a roller at point C, that's our only reaction, right? That's our only external reaction is a vertical force at C because we have a roller. At A, we have a pin. Right? So our boundary conditions, as we talked about, we had our different uh, supports that we can have for beams. Those supports provide different external reaction capabilities. So in this case, for the pin, we've got two unknown reactions. For the roller, we have one unknown reaction. So we've got right, three equations, three unknowns. Our beam is determinate. This is very good news because it takes more effort to go with indeterminate systems, right? We have to use compatibility equations. We relate internal forces to deformation. Well, in this case, we don't have to do that because we have enough equations of equilibrium to solve these uh, external reactions, right? So if we start, we would sum the forces in the x direction. We know that that has to equal zero, <coughs> right? And that would be RAX, right? That's the only unknown reaction or force that's acting in the x direction. Well, that was easy. Now we know RAX equals zero. If we sum forces in the y direction, we sum, set those equal to zero. Well, we have our external, our external force P acting at mid-span was acting in the negative y direction, right? So we would put negative P, plus we've got two vertical reactions at our two supports, right? RAY and RCY. All right, one equation, two unknowns. We need another equation where well, we have one more to use, right? Some of the moments. And you can sum the moment about any point on this beam, right? Any point on this beam, totally legal. And you're gonna develop an equation. Some areas that are worth summing moments about are point, or points to sum moments about are points on this beam where we have our external forces that act through it, right? So a point where we don't have a moment arm for those forces. Because what does that do? It pulls those equations or those uh, variables out of our equation. So if I sum the moments about, say, point A, two of my unknown reactions act through point A. They have no moment arm, so they're not going to be a part of my summing the moment, moment equation. Okay. So we set that equal to zero. So in this case, if we sum moments about A, we've got our external applied force P. It acts as at a moment arm L over two, right? Plus we've got this external reaction at C in the vertical direction. We're gonna assume it's upwards. Its moment arm is the full distance or the full length of our beam, L. We get PL over two equals RCY over, or RCYL, sorry. L's cancel. And we get P over two equals RCY. 
easy enough. We're going to take that, plug that back in to our summing the forces in the Y. That now becomes negative P plus P over 2 plus RAY equals 0. Lo and behold, we get our solution for our external reactions. Okay. We now know that the reaction at X at point A is zero. Makes sense. We have no applied external forces in the X direction. We also have P over two as our reactions at both A and C in the Y direction. Okay. That should be a huge review. You guys have done that already up to this point. A lot of homework assignments to figure out axial loads of things, right? Summing forces and summing moments. Well, now we want these diagrams which you guys also have done, should have done. Right, we have our shear force diagram and our moment diagram. So if we start our diagrams at A, and we're going to C, so this was A, this is C, somewhere in the middle here we've got B, right, where the applied load is. We'll go through some of the rules here, but for a concentrated force, right, an applied concentrated force creates a jump in the shear diagram. Right? So a positive reaction jumps our shear force diagram positive to that value, right? P over 2. So we're going to move up to P over 2. Once we're at P over 2, shear force is a function of our applied load, externally applied forces. There's no externally applied forces, then there's no change in our shear force diagram, right? So if that's the case, we have no applied loads until we get all the way over to point B, where we have our applied load of P. Again, a concentrated <laughs> force creates a jump in our shear force diagram. That jump is consistent with the sign of our applied force, right? So the reaction was a positive P over 2. We had a positive jump in shear. When we get to P, we have a negative jump in shear because we have a negative P. We go down to negative P over two. Again, no forces until we hit the reaction. Another positive, we go back to zero. always closes to zero, okay? Always closes to zero. Right? If we looked at the end of this beam, right? We had our reaction just past, just, just past our reaction, right? There's no shear in this beam anymore, right? We take all of that loading out. If there was forces in the beam, then that beam, they would need to be resolved by something equal and opposite to it, right? So it wouldn't move. Okay, if we have unresolved forces, we have motion. Okay. So, always go to zero. So that's our shear force diagram. Right, that's our curve. Anybody remember how the moment diagram relates to the shear force diagram? So the area of Yes. Well, the magnitude is your slope. The magnitude of your shear force diagram is the slope of the moment diagram. The area, which at any given point, but then as you move across here, right, the, air, the cumulative, it's really the integral, but the cumulative effect of shear, okay, gives you your ultimate magnitude of moment. We're going to run through some of these rules. Maybe. 
What? This thing is seeing its. Whoa. Right, it's going to do something like that. Our moment <clears throat> equals the area under our shear diagram, right? The magnitude of our slope is the magnitude of our shear force diagram, right? So it's P over 2. This slope is P over 2. So if we get to a maximum here, right, of P over 2 times L over 2, that's our half our, our length of our member. All right, this is our area. P over 2 times L over 2. And this is zero, based on support conditions. Right? We have a pin or a roller. We have no rotational restraint, right? No stiffness there. It pivots like a hinge, and because it pivots like a hinge, you can't have any applied moment there, right? So we know because of our support conditions that we're going to start at zero and we're going to end at zero. Okay. So we have our moment diagram, right? I'm going to give you a bunch of rules here to go through it. But super simple to remember, right? The derivation, we start with our free body diagram. Figuring out our reactions and our forces, potentially some internal forces to help us along the way, locate some critical sections, okay? Then we construct a shear force diagram based on our applied forces, right? Our externally applied loads, whether it's a uniform load, our reactions, an external point load, external moment, right? So we would apply our, our, our uh, external forces in order to create our shear force diagram, okay? Once we have our shear force diagram, then we can then construct our moment, right? Based on knowing some characteristics of the moment diagram versus the shear diagram. Nice throw. Okay. One thing I'll tell you that engineers are lazy, right? We're all pretty lazy people. If we do one solution once, I really don't want to reinvent the wheel and do it again. Okay, so very common types of loading scenarios are already done for you, okay? Or you can use them to at least check. And so out on D2L, I provided another, it's under the lecture notes, okay? I think it's 000, okay? There's prepackaged solutions. So like this is the solution that comes out of the uh, American Institute of Steel Construction Steel Manual which I think you guys, as civils, I know you guys will see this book uh, as part of your senior year, I believe. There's a last structures class, I think, that you actually go to, or that you take, okay? And so for a simply supported beam, concentrated load at the center, it gives us our reactions, it knows that they're both the same, it's a symmetry, it knows that the maximum load, right, was P over two times L over two, which is PL over four, okay? It gives us an equation for the moment as we go from support to mid-span. It also gives us deflections, which we'll use later on. All right. So if you can use these to your advantage, right? whether it's checking that you have the right shape or general behavior that you would expect out of your shear diagram or your moment diagram, or just going out here to figure out what the max moment is, okay? Helpful. Uh, just a quick question though. Yeah. What is the X value that they're noting? Is that half the distance to a force, or? This X? Yeah, the X. X is your point along the beam. Gotcha. So like if you wanted to know, so like M sub X, 
is the moment at any point as you go across the okay. beam, which is essentially the magnitude of the area in which you're going to capture as you move across, right? So it's P over two, which is your shear diagram magnitude, times whatever distance you're across. So if you wanted to know what the moment was at a quarter point, you'd take the magnitude of the shear diagram, P over two, times L over four. Okay. Otherwise, if we get outside of that realm and there isn't something in particular that's there, okay, we use the analysis, which is the via, which is the method of sections, right? Which is really just saying that where we don't know our internal forces, we cut our beam and we sum moments and sum forces, right? Essentially, just creating a new free body diagram of a subset of our initial overall. Uh, beam configuration, right? So if we had a simply supported beam and it had a linear load and a uniform load, right? Constant magnitude, uniform load. But a simply supported beam, we could then calculate what our reactions are, okay? And if we wanted to know what the forces, internal forces were along this uniformly loaded section, we could cut the beam, take it out, draw a new free body diagram. We know what our external applied loads are. Right? We have our reaction, which we would calculate from our initial free body diagram. We would have our applied load, which is a function of the distance across, where, this, where they're talking about x. Okay? And based on that, you could sum forces in some moments. Right? We have three sum forces. Well, so we have three equations, summing forces, and the x and the y, and then summing moments. Okay? This would be our loading. We would have some sort of reactions, as I mentioned, AX, AY, BY, it's a roller. these critical locations, right? Critical being locations that we deem interesting enough to us with respect to getting a free by, or a shear and moment diagram established, right? right? We know shear diagram is influenced by external forces. So in our case, right, if we knew our external applied reaction, and we know the magnitude of this externally applied load, we're probably going to want to know what that shear that uh, shear force is, say, right at the changing of loading, right? Because if we change load, we're going to change the way that our shear force diagram moves, okay? So we would cut at, at critical sections, and we would determine... our internal forces all in an effort to help us really establish our diagrams, right? Our shear and moment diagrams. Actually, internal forces Generate our shear and moment diagrams. Well, not that you remember them, but maybe you do. These are rules that we use for development of our shear diagram, okay? As we touched on in that first. An uh, example, right? A point load mid span of a simply supported beam. Right? Rule one is concentrated loads create discontinuities in the shear force diagram. Discontinuities essentially are just saying it jumps, right? So if we have a externally applied concentrated load, 
right? Say it was P naught. That magnitude is the magnitude of the jump in the shear force diagram, right? Delta V. So if we had a beam as an externally applied load, the change in our shear force diagram, okay, the magnitude of that change is the magnitude of our applied load, okay? And a positive or negative jump is based on the, ma or the sign of our externally applied load, right? Positive reaction, a positive jump, negative reaction, negative jump, negative applied load, positive applied load, right? In this case, we have a positive concentrated load. We have a positive jump in shear force, okay? And as was mentioned before, right, the magnitude of our shear diagram is the slope of our moment diagram at that point. Okay. So back here, if we went back to our, the slope of this line is P over two. Right. If this beam was a unit length of one, right, say this beam was one foot long, If that's the case, based on our areas, right, the magnitude is going to be P over 2 times 1 half or P over 4. Well, if we use this, knowing that the slope is the magnitude of our shear diagram, our slope is P over 2, we multiply that by 1 half, slope times the length gives us the rise, right, rise over run. We would get the same answer, right, P over 4. So our shear force is the slope of our moment diagram the magnitude of the change of our moment. Rule number two, the change in shear force is equal to the area under the distributed load curve, okay? The way I look at this is we essentially have a series of concentrated loads, right? And we know concentrated loads create these steps. But in our case, instead of just having one discrete concentrated load, we have an infinite number of them. Right? And they might change in magnitude. And so you're slowly changing what your shear force is as you go across, right? Your shear diagram as you go across. And so it's a series of these infinitely small little steps, right? And it doesn't look like such a discrete step because you have an infinite number of those concentrated loads. Right? So the integral is essentially just the area. Right? So if you had a uniform load, let's say it was uniform in magnitude, right? Constant in magnitude then your change in shear is going to be that magnitude, right? The, the overall magnitude times the length, right? the area underneath that shear, there, that uniform load effect. All right, rule number three, the slope of the shear diagram is equal to the intensity of the distributed load. Okay. This goes back to similar to the moment. Because we have this infinite number of concentrated loads, the slope at any given point is going to be the uniform load magnitude at that point, right? That's how it's, that's how it's stepping from one point in the beam to the next point that's right next to it, right? It's essentially taking a bunch of these little steps and putting them right next to each other. And so the slope from here to here is really this concentrated load which could be this very small concentrated magnitude right here, right? We just have an infinite number. So the slope of the shear diagram is equal to the intensity of the distributed load. Make sense? Just coming right back, you guys are just bored because you knew, know all this. Is that true? Are you bored? It's Friday. It's like 1.30. It's really nice out. Supposed to be really nice out, like into next week, which is ridiculous. Those are our rules for a shear diagram, okay? So based on those rules, the applied external forces, right? You can develop what your shear diagram looks like for any type of loading. And then once we have those, that shear diagram, we have rules for moment diagram, okay? Rule number one, 
The change in bending moment is equal to the area under the shear force diagram. We've already in that, uh, looked at that, right? Essentially the integral, just the area. We take the area of, from point A to B, okay? That's essentially gonna be the magnitude change at B, right? It's how much you're going to add or take away from the moment, internal moment, is the magnitude or of the area of your shear diagram from one point to the next, okay? Rule number five, the slope of the moment diagram is equal to the intensity of the shear force, okay? The slope of the, of the moment diagram is equal to the intensity of the shear force, right? Similar to what we did with shear, where the slope of our shear diagram was equal to the intensity of the applied load, same sort of deal, right? In our case, the slope of the moment diagram was P over two okay? for our, our concentrated load on the middle of a simply supported beam. Rule number six, concentrated moments create discontinuities in bending, di bending moment diagram, okay? The only thing to remember here is it always tripped me up is it's opposite, okay? With shear force, our discontinuity or our jump in shear is consistent with the sign of the shear force, right? External reactions are acting upward. We get an upward jump in our shear diagram. Unfortunately, for moment, that sign is opposite, okay? So you just gotta remember it's the negative. So your jump in moment is the opposite in magnitude of your applied moment. Right-hand rule still, still applies, right? So if we have a positive moment here, it does not affect the shear diagram, right? It's not an, an externally applied force, right? Reaction or concentrated load. No change in shear, but we have this negative jump in bending moment, right? It was a positive moment. We know that it's opposite, so it actually creates a negative jump in the bending moment. Ingrain that in your head. Try to. Okay? So if we jump through our general procedures, as we have with any problem in this class, With any of the problems we've dealt with, axial, torsion, right? We want to complete the load diagram. We have to figure out all the external reactions, right? All the outside stuff. In order to do that, create your favorite thing in the world, free body diagram. From this, we can get our reactions. From this, we can also determine, start to determine internal forces. Right, those are those critical locations. So from our free, free body diagram, we can then determine reactions, internal forces, and we get these internal forces from determining what these lo local or uh, critical sections are, right? Maybe changes in uh, internal sh uh, shear, changes in external applied forces, right? Places where we might see jumps in our shear diagram or our moment diagram based on these rules, right? So from that, now that we have all these internal or external applied forces, we can construct shear diagram and to do this we use rules one through three next step is locating key points on the shear force diagram
right? When the shear force is zero, we're not going to be adding or taking away from the moment. And in doing that, a lot of times those, those areas represent our maximum or minimum uh, moment locations. So we can key in on some of these critical spots in our shear force diagram, right, that help us determine which sections of our beam are, say, increasing moment, decreasing moment, the moment stays the same. And then from that, we can use that understanding to construct the bending moment. four through six for this second set of rules. All right, let's get through this. New example. We want to find shear and moment diagrams for this beam. Very simple. Example, pin support on, at point A, apply loads at B and C, varying magnitudes. We got 12 kips at B, 10 kips at C, and then we have a roller support at D. All right. If we first start by looking at our free body diagram, right? So if we pull our beam out and look at our applied forces, right? Our external forces, which would be our reactions. In this case, we have two at our pin support, one at our roller, and then we have our applied forces, right? 12 kips at B, 10 kips at point C. Ooh. Screwed that up. This is DY. Man, someone's just buzzing the university, huh? This is our free body diagram. Three unknowns. Determinant, right? Three equations, three unknowns. Solving, we have some of the forces in the x equals zero. Again, that's pretty easy. We've got no applied forces in the x. That leaves us our reaction at A as our only force, which means that has to equal zero. Some of the forces in the y equal zero. Well, we have our applied reaction at A, our 12 kip concentrated load, our 10 kip concentrated load, and then our reaction at D. Well, that's one equation with two unknowns. We're gonna need another equation. I'm gonna sum moments here. Again, I'm gonna sum moments about point A because it has two external reactions acting on it that I want to get out of this equation. Don't have to though. You could sum moments about B, C, D, or anywhere in the middle. You could develop the same solution. So you got negative 12 applied load. It has a four foot moment arm. 10 kip load has a 12 foot moment arm. Our reaction at D has a 21 foot moment arm, right? And the signs of these follow our right hand rule sign convention for a moment. Right hand rule, fingers curl in the direction of the applied load, right? Twisting about point A, thumbs pointing into the page that's negative. Same goes for the second applied load. And then finally our reaction, well I assume that it's acting upward, so that applied moment is actually twisting to the left, right? Pointing out of the page. So if we do that, solve for dy, 
we get eight kips. If we go back to summing the forces in the y direction using our dy as eight kips, we get our reaction at A of 14 kips. So now we've solved our free body diagram. We've determined our externally applied forces, right? We had two that we already knew, but we had our reactions. We didn't know, we just developed what those were. We're gonna go to step two. So this was step one, step two, right? That was developing our shear diagram based on our three rules. Well, rule number one tells us that our change in our shear force is equivalent to our external concentrated for, uh, loads, right? So we have our reactions or our applied point loads. In our case, our reaction at A was 14 kips. We know that it's acting upwards, so we know that the shear force diagram is going to bump up, right? So if we draw another line that represents our shear diagram, we're going to jump up right to 14 kips. And we know based on our rules that the change in our shear force diagram is equivalent to our external applied forces. Well, we have no external applied forces between A and B, right? So if that's the case, we are going to just stay steady at 14 kips until we hit to B. B, we have applied load. This time it's 12 kips, negative direction. So we're gonna have a negative jump in our shear force diagram of 12 kips. So we're gonna get down to two kips of shear, positive shear in this beam. Again, externally applied forces create jumps in our shear diagram, right? Concentrated forces are concentrated jumps. Uniform forces create a slope in the shear diagram. We have neither between B and C. So we're going to just stay at two kips until we get to C. C applies a force of 10 kips in the negative direction, which creates a negative jump, right? Negative jump, two minus 10 would be negative eight. Again, no change between C and D. And at D, right, we have a applied reaction due to our roller dy of eight kips. Eight kips is positive, acting upward. So it's gonna bring our shear force diagram back to zero, which we wanna see, right? Any questions about that? So that's our shear diagram, pretty easy. Right. Remember, step three is to figure out some critical locations on our shear diagram, which may help us figuring out the shape or magnitudes of our moment diagram. Well, in this case, if we were looking for our maximum or a minimum moment, that's going to have to be at C, right? That's where our shear force diagram goes to zero. Up until this point, we know we have positive area. If we have any positive area in our shear force diagram, we're going to be adding moment, right? If we're adding moment, when we go to zero, after we pass the zero mark, we're going to be subtracting moment. When we're subtracting moment, we're gonna be reducing that magnitude. So we're gonna be at a maximum, right? So we better, based on developing our moment diagram, find that at C, we have a maximum. So if we go to step four, no concentrated moments, no initial area of the shear diagram at this point, and our boundary conditions are telling us also, right, that we have no moment at our support, right? It's a, it's a pin or roller. So we're, we're gonna start at zero. Based on that, we know that 
<coughs> the change in our moment is the area under the shear diagram, right? Or the magnitude of our shear diagram is the slope of our moment diagram. So if our magnitude's 14 kips, going from A to B, which was, I think it was four feet, right? As we travel the first four feet of this beam, the slope of our moment diagram is gonna be 14 kips per foot, right? Or kips, I guess, sorry, that's the slope. Times it by length gives us kip feet, which is our magnitude. So we are going to ride at a slope of 14 kips. And the magnitude at the end of that slope is the area under our shear diagram. If we wanted to know the magnitude at halfway up this slope, it'd be half the area, right? And so on and so forth. So we looked at the magnitude, or if I look at it and you guys think about it, we got 14 kips times four feet. We have 56 kip feet. Well now, as we've gotten to this point, the shear diagram changes, magnitude changes. The magnitude changes, that means the slope changes. So our ability to increase the moment gets reduced from 14 kips as our slope to two kips as our slope. So we're gonna do something like this. Where we go like so. In this case, we've got 56, right? That was our initial magnitude, plus the area now underneath the shear diagram, right? This area is gonna give us our complete magnitude of 72 kip feet. Now we reached our pinnacle, right? We have no more positive area once we go beyond point C. Everything else is negative area. So we're gonna be reducing our moment from here on out. That magnitude of that slope is gonna be eight kip, right? Negative eight. So if you look at that slope, or I look at that slope now, what is going on? All right, this is negative eight. This is positive two. Well, if we look at negative eight and we look at our complete area, this is gonna be 72 minus eight times nine. Well, shit, that's equal to zero. And we close out at zero, which makes sense. Based on our boundary conditions, we should have closed at zero, right? And we made that assumption originally when we figured out our free body diagram, right? The reactions we provided here were just uh, uh, forces and not moments. So we cut down to zero. If we wanted to figure out what the moment was at a given location, maybe we had some sort of connection there. Maybe we decided to splice this beam. At that location. Okay, maybe it was two feet over. We'd wanna know what the internal forces are at that point, right? We have some critical things we're gonna to have to design, maybe welds or splice plates or bolts, some sort of configuration. So we wanna know what the internal force is. Well, if we had this diagram, we could, knowing the slope and the distances, we could figure out those magnitudes, right? In both of our diagrams, we know for a fact that our shear at that point is gonna be negative eight kips. And then our moment is gonna be 72 minus eight times two, right? Which is gonna get us over a minus 16 
But we could also use the method of section, which all it says is we would draw a free body diagram. at our cut, right? And we would sum moments and sum forces so we're going to cut to find internal forces. So here, if we wanted to sum the moments about our cut, right, sum the moments about the end, We would get 14 times 14 minus 12 times 10 minus 10 times 2 plus the moment that we imposed, right? That's our little m. We get m equal to 56 kip feet, which is 72 minus 16, which is the same way you could do it by looking at the diagram, right? So this is called method of sections. The last page in here to take with you, okay, is just giving you some relationships based on if our uh, shear force diagram looks one way, what is our moment diagram? Okay, if it's constant and positive, then our moment is linear and increasing. Okay, the integral of the shear diagram is our moment, okay. So we have, we add an extra order. So if our shear diagram is linear, then we have a quadratic or a second order behavior to our, our moment diagram, okay? That's it. Don't forget the quiz. But also have a great weekend.